Now many people say, if God elects who would be saved, why would anyone evangelize? But is that really the effect of the Reformation? Welcome to The Conquering Truth. I'm Dan Horn. I'm Jonathan Sides. I'm Charles Churchill. And I'm Joshua Horn. Every year our church, Reformation Baptist Church, that sponsors this podcast, does a celebration for Reformation Day. It's really important for us to remember what God has done in the past, how he has transformed the world. If you're in Raleigh, North Carolina on October 31st, we'd, we'd love for you to join us. We do a meal and we have a time where we really think about what God has done. And the, the theme for this year's conference is Missionaries of the Reformation. Because when the Reformation started, there were lots of people who had a form of Christianity. Christendom was filled with people who, who just followed rites without actually following Christ and actually even knowing much about, about who God was. And all of a sudden, and particularly according to Luther, the, the doctrine of election starts to, to come up as to who is saved and how are you saved through the will of God rather than through the will of man. And when that, that comes, that ignites a, a, a transformation of the church in many ways, and it ends up going and spreading to be a worldwide revival. And so we want to consider just how that, how that worked, because God does, does work through means to bring about his ends. And it was a real revival and a real shift, and it's things that we can learn from today. So let's start with why would a return to the doctrine of election actually cause the missionaries' movement to increase rather than to decrease? Well, I think if you look at what was going on at the time of the Reformation, you had, uh, before the Reformation, the Catholic Church, um, and they had really uh, lost the true gospel, or it, in those parts that hadn't lost it, they had put on so many layers of false doctrine and false teaching that it was the f true gospel was really obscured. You know, sure, they would say, follow Jesus, but they were also saying, follow Mary, follow a saint for every single day of the year. And so... You know, the message of Christ, the message of the Bible, and the message of the early church um, was not being preached. And so when you have these uh, changes through, the, through God's work through the Reformers, where they are peeling off a lot of these layers of corruption and returning to what the Scripture was teaching on election, on all these different topics, I mean, it's natural that the gospel is going to spread because now you actually have the true gospel and not the true gospel under a massive pile of garbage. And truth really has power over lies, and that's part of it, right, is that all these people have been doing these rituals for a long time, and the rituals may seem to satisfy, but they're also completely fake and completely meaningless, the rituals that they're going through. And so as soon as you start to have truth, those rituals, and all those rituals were based on works-based righteousness, right? You have to say a certain number of Hail Marys, you have to say, you know, all repentance is all about your works and all these things. And so all of a sudden you come along with the truth that it's it's because of God's mercy that you're saved rather than your works. And that's that really shakes the idea of bowing down to Mary somehow will make your life better. So one of the things that happens is you have, a, you know, somebody somewhere finds an old copy of the Bible. They start reading the Bible and they say this, and it's usually some monk who's picked it up out of a library where it hasn't been read for decades. And they start reading it and they say, Everybody needs to read this. And then, you know, and then you get lots of things that happen downstream of that. It's just like in the Bible when Josiah found the lost book of the law. And all of a sudden, there's tearing of clothes and reforming of all the practices. And because, oh, this is what truth is, and we've forgotten this, and we haven't been doing what it said to do. And so you have this where people find the Bible, and they say, look at all of these doctrines that fall out of it. Election was a central one because it was one that was really at the heart of what a lot of the debates were over. It was one of the things that had been widely forgotten. And then downstream of that, you have people who start translating it, and then it goes to common households. And just there are lots of things that happen when you just open up the Bible and say, hey, what does God say? And whatever he says, let's do that. And so before that, you have people who, they may even have faith, but they have no word of God. They have no access to the word of God. They have a priest that doesn't know the word of God, that's not preaching the word of God. And so their life doesn't end being transformed as much as it would be for other people because the truth is, is the Holy Spirit does teach us truth. He does take a heart of stone, replace it with the heart of righteousness. He causes us to, to love the law. But at the same time, 
God uses the law to sanctify people and to cause them to be holy. And that's really the basis of, of mission work. It says in Romans 1, 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And where it's quoting, the idea there is that if you have faith, you start to obey God, right? You treat him as Lord. The just will live by their faith is more the Old Testament quote that's being made. And so the idea is, is that when people start to live by faith, that actually spreads because it reveals the righteousness of God. It reveals the truth of who God is. And the, the faith goes forward from faith to faith because of obedience and because of submission to the word of God. And so that's kind of the basis of how you get the missionary movement and how you get the, the Reformation spreading even as far as places like Brazil. And a lot of the missionary movement starts in ways that we would think um, were not mission work at all, really. Uh, because the issue you had before the Reformation is you had these nations where everyone was a Christian, and yet in reality, very few people were Christians. Where they, you know, the Christianity they had was you're baptized into the church, and then, you know, through your life, there's a lot of things you're supposed to do. If you don't do them, you know, you're still a Christian, unless the Pope excommunicates you. And then, really, you're still a Christian anyway. Because unless he burns you at the stake, and people are going to be okay with you, you know, you're, you're a Christian. Everyone's a Christian. And with the Reformation, when they're saying, actually, we need to have faith, and actually, let's look at what the Scripture says, and there's actually requirements to repent of sin. You know, you get a, you get a vast uh, transformation where you have uh, the preachers who are influenced by the Reformation actually telling people you need to repent of your sins. And just because you are here sitting in the pews— or standing on the church floor doesn't mean you're a Christian. And you actually, there's actually a requirement for repentance and there's a requirement for, you know, a new birth. Um, and, and it's something where it goes down even more basic than that, because one of the issues they had at the Reformation is that the, uh, you know, the, the position of pastor or priest, um, that was something that was like a career, but it was a career that was more like a sinecure where you get the job, but you don't, but you're getting the title and you're getting the paycheck, you're not actually having to do any work. So you don't have to live where you're the pastor of. You don't have to ever preach. You don't have to do virtually anything in a lot of areas. And so, you you know, the, you go from not having a pastor in your church on Sunday to having a pastor who's preaching repentance. And even though he is, you know, no one has left their home at all, you suddenly have got a vast amount of missions going on and evangelism going on just in these Christian nations. And I think even like kind of how it starts, right, is in a lot of ways, it's Luther's writings and those go forth. And when you think about it, again, you have all these places that all are nominally Christian, right? By name, they're Christians, but they have no practice of Christianity. But in there, there is going to be a mix because the church never disappears. There's going to be a mix of people who God has given the gift of faith to. And they're actually hungry, right? Because the Bible talks about you being hungry for the Word of God. And so they're hungry. And so all of a sudden, Luther writes these books. And the books, because of the printing press, they can be distributed a lot easier. And the real first mission work, if you will, is sending out books. And then the people that are actually hungry, they pick up the books and start to read it. And they start to go, wait, this is this is what true Christianity is, not the thing that has, and a lot of them were priests or were associated with the church in some way. But they go, this is what true Christianity is, not what the Roman Catholic Church has been teaching. It's an interesting way to define missions, because when I think about missions in, in a modern context, if you go into any church and they talk about the missionaries that they have, it's almost always talking about foreign missions. Right. It's we have people here and we want to send people somewhere else, I, you know, to unreached groups, people who don't have the gospel, don't have the Bible in their language things like that. That's what we think of being of mission work being is you have to go somewhere else. Right, from the 19th century missionary movement largely is where we get that definition. So it's a relatively recent definition. And what you're saying is that this that it would be appropriate to talk about early things happening in the Reformation as being missionary work. Mm -hmm. Where Luther writes books and all of a sudden those books get widely distributed especially in the universities. And they're talked about and they're read and they're debated there. And then from there, you get these students who start taking them out, taking those ideas out, some of them dying for it. And you look at Peter and right. Peter was a 
you know, he's called the apostle to the circumcised, but he's really a missionary to those who are circumcised. He's a missionary to Judea largely, right? I mean, that's where most of his mission field was, was was where the Jews were, which were supposed to be the people of God. And so this isn't like there isn't a real New Testament pattern of this very thing. And I think a lot of times we think, yeah, you need to go overseas, where the reality is the church down the street might be a better mission field than going overseas. I mean, if, you know, ostensibly the, the reason why there was a foreign missions movement is because if, if missions is just literally doing the work of building the church, watering, sowing, planting, building up, teaching, and all those things, there may have been a point where there, where there were so many people in the fields that it made sense to go to other places. There can be a point where you do start to look and say, are there other places we should be going? But the answer is, is at all times, there's a need for the work to be done locally. And sometimes, like in America today, there's a huge need. I mean, there's, it's not like we're sitting here with the fields are full of people working. It's not like, I mean, we're at a point where fields have been abandoned for years and they need to actually be replowed and they need, you almost need to go back and reestablish things that have been forgotten in the America, you know, in America that used to be things that everyone knew. You know, you look at the missionary movement and people like David Livingston, they needed to hear the gospel. Because they were, they were preaching a false gospel. They were preaching a very liberal Presbyterian gospel. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't what Luther taught. It wasn't the doctrine of election. I mean, that's not where Livingston was coming from. He, they had already lost it. His church that it sent him or that he went forth from, they needed to be evangelized. Right. They needed missionaries sent to them, and instead they're sending. And you look at especially the 20th century you know, the missionaries that get sent out, most of them are sent out with really horrible doctrine. I mean, I go to Nigeria, and in Nigeria, there's all this charismatic stuff that's that people, Creflo Dollar is not preaching a real gospel. Benny Hinn's not preaching a real gospel, but yet these people have a missionary movement, and they have people that they're sending out, and they're, and they're basically spreading a false gospel. And it's very easy for us to think, oh, missionaries should happen overseas. Well, no, missionaries should happen where there's false belief and especially false profession because Paul always went to the Jews first and then the Greeks. And if, you know, I think Joshua identified the problem really well. It's everyone was a Christian, but no one was a Christian in a sense. Everyone was politically a Christian, but nobody was a Christian in their heart. And then that's the era in which the Reformation drops in. And all of a sudden people say, oh, you have to be a Christian in your heart. And I think, you know, when we look at these things and talk about these things, it's one of the things that's important now is because there's, it's, I think Charles said it before, that's very much where the United States is now. It's not like we're vastly different. You know, we're, we're reducing rapidly the percentage of people that say they're Christians. But, you know, 10 years ago, it was like 70 percent. But what percent were actually be Christians? Well, we wouldn't have murdered 50 million babies if 70 percent of the country were Christians. We wouldn't mil- murder 50 million baby if, babies if 10 percent of the of America was Christians. I mean, it's one of the things when Joshua was saying that everyone's a Christian, you need to understand what that means in practice is, is it means you also make all their sins Christian too. Right. And so the church, I mean, so if everyone's a Christian, then all their practices are Christian. So, so the church becomes something, and you go back to the verse we were reading where it says the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, right? I mean, and so there's this part of it where it's like, I mean, if the church isn't doing this, then there is no righteousness being revealed because in the end, Everyone's a Christian. So whatever you're doing is Christian, and there is no holiness. And so this is really something that started the change is you started to have a people who were holy, and whenever you have a people say, we're holy, and you are not, that ends up just, I mean, everything that happened in the Reformation, everything that happened as a result of it, where people end up getting pushed in other places, like you said, where it goes really far, is just kind of a byproduct of a people come in and say, and we're going to obey God, and we're going to make a distinction. We're going to make a distinction between what's holy and what's not holy. And you have, you know, some pretty basic uh, doctrines they were overthrowing. They were doing that exact thing of making the sins Christian. You know, you have indulgences where you pay money to have the sin erased, and you have confession where it's made into a sacrament where you've sinned. You just need to tell the priest about it, and you're good. And they've they've made those sins now Christianized, a way to easily, painlessly, and without repentance to get rid of the sin. Right. And the only real sins were the mortal sins, right? The other sins were, yeah, you had to pay a little money or have some candles burned or some mass say, said or pay indulgences. But there were only a few sins that were supposed to be like actually made you not a Christian, which means all the other sins made you still be a Christian and that there was no idea that don't be deceived. Those who practice righteousness are righteous and those who don't aren't. 
And one of the things you should, you should really remember here as we say this is we put, like you mentioned like Luther, and there's a huge focus a lot of times in thinking of the Reformation as happening right with Luther. But a lot of these things, like Jonathan was saying, there were times where priests would find the Bible and start reading it and be shocked by it. And this had been happening for a couple of hundred years prior to the Reformation. I mean, it had been happening all along because right. God's, well, church, is, and other God's church has never been dead. But there's a sense of it where we just kind of forget that, you know, you can go back, you can see John Huss, you can see Wycliffe, you can see many other people who had found God's Word, who had been doing things, had been writing things, Wycliffe in particular, had been doing translations and had been actually putting the Bible in a place where people could actually read it, could see it, could understand it, and could know what God actually required of it, of, of them. And just you understand how, I mean, how drastically that changes things in a nation when all of a sudden people say, these are the words of God. Because before they're having a priest tell them things. Like I said, frequently the priest was doing the Mass in Latin, so they don't even know what he's saying. And then they read God's Word and they go, this is for me. This is a command from the God of heaven to me directly. And that those writings just made a huge change in the way that people could actually think about God, think about religion, and understand what God required of them. And kind of what you what happens, right? You have Wycliffe that he he ends up Huss, who's on the other side of Europe, right? I mean, Huss is like in the Czech Republic, right. and you have Wycliffe in England. But yet, Huss is reading Wycliffe's writings. So you have the Hussite movement that's you know happening based on what Wycliffe was writing. And, and so you see that kind of same missionary thing that's happening through writings. That was happening 100 years before when Huss is reading this stuff. But yet, then all of a sudden, the church came up and said, we'll kill them. And it worked. And one of the reasons that, that Luther was successful in, in sending out these books that had such an influence before the Roman Catholic Church like rose again was because the Ottoman Empire was attacking, through, attacking Europe through Austria. It was besieging Vienna. And the Pope was a lot more worried about that. And so these books go out and they spread. So then by the time the Pope has defeated the, the Muslims— then all of a sudden he turns around and this is every place. So it's like the seed was scattered. And so all of a sudden you have all these people that are speaking Lutheran doctrine and he tries to stop it, but it's not nearly as successful as it was with, with us because, you know, the time had changed and, and God was doing other things and God was preparing the field so that, that these books could really have a missionary appeal that, that caused people to change how they were thinking about who God was. I think one of the things that we should kind of, something we should always be thinking about is that God's always directing his people and he's always directing events because there's this part of it, like you said, I mean, books have been written before. There have been things that have been done before and there were circumstances that allowed, that God allowed those who were evil to squelch some of those who were trying to do what was good. And, you know, Huss, a hundred years before Luther, right? I mean, there's, a, and, and it doesn't mean between Huss and Luther that no one was worshiping God. There were, certainly there were places where this was happening, but God orchestrates things. And there's a part of it where our, this is one of the things about election is the shift was our obligation is not on producing some specific result. It's obeying God. God's in charge of the ends. God will take care of getting to the ends. We're supposed to focus on, are we doing what he's told us to do? And so Luther wasn't doing anything fundamentally different than Wycliffe had done. He wasn't doing anything fundamentally different than Huss had done. But God had prepared this moment, and God had pre- God had prepared the Muslims to take the attention of the church away. So, at, and He had prepared the printing press. All of these things He had orchestrated it. And so, when we look at the world today, it's just really important. To, we look at it, and we go, we see the evil, and we see certain things. God's in total control in no different way. And so we really need to come back and focus on the election and, and understanding that God is in charge and we're to, we're to focus on the means and not to focus on the ends. And I do think, I mean, there is an interesting when you look at, at what Huss was pushing on versus what Luther was pushing on. Because Huss, in a lot of ways, was pushing on you shouldn't have this great separation with the, with the priesthood. Right, I mean, the, the Hussite flag was the cup because basically they said it shouldn't just be the priest drinking the cup. The people should drink the cup too. And they killed him for that. And they killed him for that. And, and they killed him for that because in the end he was pushing on that there's a you know sacred secular, that there's a priesthood. It's not priesthood of believers. It's, it's, there's a unique priesthood, and Huss was coming a lot closer to every Christian should do it. So it was much more like along the lines of the priesthood of believers. Well, Luther is— he says, what I'm fighting for is 
what we would call election and in that idea or Calvinistic doctrine, Calvinistic soteriology. And God says, you know, that is his glory. I mean, that's what he says in Romans 9. This is his glory. And so there is a sense that Luther was also emphasizing the doctrine that was most related to God's glory. And when all of a sudden the the shift shifts from the glory of man to the glory of God, we should expect God to bless that. And that's very much what Luther was doing. A lot of times people go, why do you focus so much on election? And that really is important to understand. Like you were quoting from Romans 9, and that goes back to where Paul's quoting from Exodus, where Moses goes up on the mountain and he says to God, show me your glory. And God says, I will make my glory pass before you. And he says, that glory is, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will show compassion to whom I will show compassion. And it is, I mean, and that is what God says is his glory. That, I mean, and, I mean, I just, it's, it's really easy to forget that. It's really easy to think that elections this, this, an, this annoying truth that people have to accept. And that, yeah, you can focus on everything else, and you need to acknowledge that God chooses all things. And God says, no, do you understand? That's what it means for me to be God. And I do think, I mean, I mean, when you said that, I hadn't really thought about the fact of the significance of that, because I think it's just really easy to look at it and go, it's just one of a number of doctrines. And, and it, it's not the totality of everything. But and God it, says it's his glory. And, it, and it's not a paradox that when people rediscover this doctrine, more people got saved. Right. than were before. Right. And I mean, it, I think it's really important to recognize, too, that, right, in Deuteronomy 32, the song that Moses teaches to Israel before they go into the promised land and before Moses dies, his first line is, or close to his first line, is ascribe greatness to your God. And then he goes, basically, if you don't ascribe greatness to your God, you will forget who he is, you will think you did it all yourself, and then he will come and kill you all. Right? That's the sure. rest of Deuteronomy 32. And so when the doctrine of election is, is reestablished and reunderstood, that is the heart of ascribing greatness to your God. And so when you ascribe greatness to your God, that is how you take back a people who have, are nominally Christians and turn them back to be a people that actually know the difference between those who are saved and those who aren't saved. It comes from ascribing greatness to your God. So the people who say missionary movements, I mean, why would you bother if, you, if you're if you saying the elect? Well, the reason you bother is it's the glory of God. And this is how people are saved for God's glory. And you ascribe greatness to God and say, this is who God is. He's not like man. And they want to make him like man. And so with Huss, you see the persecution where they kill Huss and the Reformation that's starting— you know, it continues in Bohemia, so I don't want to, you know, Czech, modern Czech Republic, so I don't want to eliminate it entirely. But basically, persecution was enough to stop that one. Or drive them all into the hills. Or drive them into but the they, they actually Well, the Waldenses have been in the hills for 600 years yeah, before that. And then so. the Hussites are in their own hills. And, yeah. You know. And, but they actually defeat the Holy Roman Empire, so they kind of actually have their own nation. And yeah, but in the but hills, that's, <laughs> yes. But that's kind of another story. But anyway, the conies. <laughs> but but you do get all of a sudden with Luther that it's different because it has spread, and it, I do think it is tied more to God's glory. So persecution has the opposite effect. Instead of stopping people, when the persecution starts, people are seeing the effect of faith in these people's lives, and the persecution actually, you know, some of the greatest missionaries were the people that were put to death at the stake, which is not what we think of as missionaries. Right. And, I mean, and it's the thing is uh, the famous saying is the blood of the martyrs is the uh, seat of the church, where it's— you know, the, the martyrs where they're actually killing the people who are in the church is actually helping grow the church. And, of course, it's all God's work and not not a strict, you know, cause and effect. Because you can get books on the Reformation in Italy and the Reformation in Spain because there were a lot of reformers there and they got killed. And the Reformation was large. I mean, it didn't spread in Italy and it didn't spread in Spain. Uh, but certain places God used the death of the martyrs in remarkable ways to really grow the church. I mean, you can see that in Hebrews when it talks about, you know, from God's perspective, it's all, you know, those that were that were put to death, those that were killed by, you know, that were torn asunder by beasts, and then those that God gave great blessings to. And so, I mean, it's it's very clear that I mean, from God's perspective, in the end, those who have faith, 
that's really what moves the church forward. And he uses, there are seasons where he uses the death of his saints. There are seasons where he uses the prosperity of his saints. And right. and both of those are, are very true. And it's you, you can't have one and not the other because God says he uses it all. But, you know, in Acts 11, it talks about how, you know, right after, you know, in the first generation, how the church, like, expanded out rapidly. And you kind of see the same thing happen in the Reformation. In Acts 11, 19 through 21, it says, Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. So as you were saying, persecution, sometimes persecution doesn't do anything. Sometimes it's prosperity that leads people to Christ. But frequently it is like what happened in Acts, especially where you have, if you look at, at Europe and compare it to, to, to Judea and those areas where the persecution starts, I mean, there's a whole bunch of people who say they're the children of God that aren't the children of God. And God uses that and uses a persecution to, to spread the gospel in those areas and spread the gospel not just in those areas but beyond those areas. I mean, the persecution does a lot of things. One of the things it does is it can make people move. I mean, there are certain people who die, and then there are other people who flee it. Right. And and that the effect of that fleeing is really interesting because it can it it ends up you flee persecution to a place where you're not persecuted, and you start getting these communities of Christianity that happens. I mean, we want to say that's a big part of the of the founding of the United States was people who were fleeing religious persecution came here, started religious communities, but that was. That was something that had been happening for a couple hundred years in the Reformation with just, oh, I'm being persecuted here in France. I better go to Switzerland, things like that. And I mean, you look at one of the, you know, the most notable places that that happens to is Geneva because you have John Knox go there from, from Scotland after he gets freed from slavery. He, he goes there because it's too dangerous to go back to, to Scotland and you have Calvin go there and you have Farrell go there and you have all these – these men so that you get this this intellectual grouping that causes everybody to be stronger so that all of a sudden you get this richness of doctrine that comes out of there because you get all these all these men of God that are being persecuted that were driven together to a religious community like you said and that religious community ends up really changing the world and it it starts with being refugees right which you know even Calvin who's the one who's lived in Geneva for many years and is associated most closely with Geneva. Even he, I believe, went there as you know, he was fleeing persecution and he ends up settling there and being the, you know, he's driven out for a little while, but, you know, his ministry there with all these refugees uh, really helps train a lot of people who go out and spread uh, the gospel, spread the Reformation throughout Europe. And even, you know, for, for Calvin, even he wrote the Institutes of Christian Religion, which is a very important book in Christian history just because it's somebody that's trying to systematize theology. I mean, that's a that's a big deal compared to Roman Catholicism where everything was just the scatterbrain thing that had no consistency, no logic, no, no reason. And the reason he wrote that was to send it to the king of France so that he could go back to France and not be killed. And so, you know, you look at it, and that's a result of persecution. That's a result of being a refugee where he's going and saying, you'd stop persecuting people if you just understood we're actually speaking the true Christian religion as opposed to what the Roman Catholics are teaching. And, of course, the king didn't listen. <laughs> but, but still, it's a, it's a book that's very useful for the church today, and it was formed because of, of him being a refugee and persecution. And when Calvin does it and writes it to the king of France, I mean, he does four more editions. After the first edition, he pretty much knew the king of France wasn't going to listen. He wasn't doing the other four editions for the king of France, even right. though the introduction's still there. He was doing it and fleshing it out more and increasing the understanding for for the people that were reading it, which was not the king. I mean, he was he was obviously had denied it by that point. And so Calvin and writing it, writing it for the king, but that doesn't mean that God didn't have far greater purposes. For and it. it's it's helpful to to know with Calvin's background, he was trained as a lawyer, so he is writing this as a legal argument in the context of persecution, and he's also doing it as an open letter. Like a anybody can see, this is not private correspondence between me and that king. Right. I want you to know what we really think over here. 
And it's a lot more than just conference institutes. You know, a lot of these refugee groups, a big focus that they had was developing their theology and then writing books and sending them back to the countries. Even if it, you know, it wasn't, even if they knew that if they showed up, they would be killed. Um, they had ways to smuggle the books in, to print them, and to send them, even to send Bibles where, you know, the their home country didn't have the Bible or didn't have a good translation of the Bible. They'll print the Bibles and, you know, places like the, Nether the Netherlands was a big one where there was more freedom of religion. And so they sent a lot of stuff from the Netherlands. A lot of English, Scottish reformers go there, write books, send them back to England. And a lot of people read those books and end up, you know, end up reforming themselves. And there's a huge contrast between, like you're talking about this being a concentration of, of thinkers in one area, there's a huge contrast between that and the monasteries because they were very involved with day-to-day -day things and real things in like literally like the running of a city. I mean, whereas they weren't, all these people weren't necessarily direct civil magistrates, but they had real positions of influence directly with the city of Geneva. And with actually, with you know, a whole bunch of refugees brought from all around the world and put into a small area, doesn't usually result in a, by nature into a peaceful town that gets run well. And so you have to deal with sin. You have to deal with all sorts of complexities, different cultures, different, you know, viewpoints, you know, competing political desires. And so it was a very practical group of people who were also thinking very deeply about things, but not separated from the world. If I remember, I mean, Geneva was like three or 4,000 people, and then it peaked at 21,000 with the refugees. So that, you know, what, to make your point, I mean, that's a huge amount of people to absorb by a pretty small number of people. Right. And so so that's kind of what happened in, in Geneva. And like you said, they are not just, just sitting there intellectual. They start the consistory. They start these other things so that they – they're they're trying to constrain sin, even though you have all these refugees that are allegedly fleeing because of they're being persecuted for righteousness' sake. But some of them aren't. Right. Some of them are fleeing for Just, other reasons, and you have to deal with it. And they're right. sinners and everything else. One of the things that's happening throughout Europe is in it was fifteen fifty five. You have the Peace of Augsburg, which is not really peaceful. It's this truce, more or less, where the the Holy Roman Emperor says that any given prince, king, duke, whatever, has the authority to declare which version of Christianity will be practiced in his region. And that if you live in that region, you either have to convert to whatever that local says is the rule of law, or you have to, you have to leave. And so that's what is happening is in, and then it doesn't actually work out that well. And then the emperor doesn't really honor it. So it leads to wars and wars and wars until, you know, 100 years later or so. But but what that happens is all of a sudden you get these migrations of people, which really we think of, you think about how easy it is to move. You think about how easy it is for somebody to move from one state in the United States to another state or even to another country in, in the modern world. It just wasn't like that. People didn't really move. This was a relatively new thing for large numbers of people to be displaced like this. In a sense, and, you could say it started It started 200 years earlier with the Black Death because prior to that, nobody moved. You just didn't move at all. But then the Black Death happens. You knock out a giant portion of the population of Europe, and all of a sudden somebody in a neighboring town says, I need somebody to farm my land, come farm my land. So it happens a little bit, but then this drops down and people say, I, I can't live here, I need to move. And so you have these shifting populations in Europe, which that's new, that's relatively new. Right. If you're in the Raleigh-Durham area on October 31st, please come join us for Reformation Day. Every year our church celebrates that event, and this year our theme is the Missionaries of the Reformation. If you're interested, please go to CelebrateReformationDay.com. There will be information there, you can RSVP and get details. And please contact us if you're coming. We'd love to have you there. And so, yeah, we've been talking about other ways, but it's it's worth also noting that, you know, what we think of missionaries was also something that happened. It wasn't that it was just these other things like books and like a group of refugees going places, but but Geneva was actually very deliberate and very specific about sending people out that were you know, doing what we would call missionaries now. Like John Knox obviously was a missionary. He goes back to Scotland and yeah, that's you know ends up 
really having a huge influence on the the Reformation in Scotland. But it's not just that. It's you know Geneva sends out, and they start with with starting schools so that they can train pastors. So they're not trying to to re to replicate the Roman Catholic Church, where the Roman Catholic Church had all these all these priests that actually knew nothing, like Joshua was saying. They didn't have to preach. They didn't have to do anything. They just, sometimes at very young ages, they would become a bishop where they were just getting a check. You know, not literally a check, but they get their, their bag of gold once a year or whatever. And so, you know, these, these this, is, this is like a huge shift to say, wait a second, before we send anybody out, they actually have to know something. And, and that's really a, an effect of the Reformation. So all of a sudden you have people that are being sent out that can actually explain the Word of God and say what God means and talk about doctrine and talk about election and talk about it is God who chooses who is saved. You were talking about Geneva and, and how the population there swelled to about 21,000. And, and it's interesting, Calvin's response to that wasn't, oh, great, all these people are here. It was, great, you came really here, big church now. we're going to train you. And then you should go home. Right. So you have all of these, and it's mostly, I mean, Geneva's French speaking. Most of the people are French, although there are English There's, speaking. Right. You know, that's where the Geneva Bible is translated, and it's an English translation of the Bible because there's an English population there, but it's mostly French. And, and Calvin's training all of these French pastors and then sending them back into France to be missionaries i you know i don't know any other way to describe it you know to go into a place where there's no gospel and to take the gospel and preach the gospel right what we would think of as modern missionaries and just to you know the success of it is really astounding that most people don't even recognize in seven years there was about 2150 churches planted in france i mean that's like a huge number from this little and i think they sent in roughly 2000 missionaries and they ended up with about 2,150 churches planted in a seven-year period. And so we look at this and we go, you know, it's it's easy to go, why would they do these things and how? But the first thing to start with is, did they do them? And the answer is absolutely. And they did them far more effectively and far more significantly with a far greater expenditure of resources than then most churches that go, oh, if you're Calvinist, you would never evangelize. Most churches don't nearly reach the level that Geneva reached, and Geneva had a huge influence. Right. And if you know, if you jump ahead a century or two, um, you might know that France is a heavily Catholic country, but it, that doesn't mean that the mission to France failed because the the French Huguenots had a major impact. They were a, a huge force politically, religiously in France. And although they don't end with, you know, making France a Protestant country, they do have a lot of success for many years. And I mean, one of the things that happens like with the Huguenots is that after, after the St. Bartholomew Day massacre, right, is that they're really driven out of France. And you see, you know, a lot of, you know, like Paul Revere and his parents, uh, Franklin and his parents, they're all they're all coming from Huguenot stock that was driven out because of of the persecution that happens in France after basically the king says, we're going to kill off a third of our country, which is really interesting when you think about it, right? Because that's showing how far the Protestant movement advanced in France so that they thought it was about a third of the people that they were basically willing to kill to preserve the Roman Catholic religion. And so a huge number flee, and that has a huge impact on the United States. And they go to Germany, and they go to Netherlands, and they go to England, and then a lot of them end up in the United States. Yes. Right, which, you know, that's all. There, there's a lot of places that refugees came from to the United States, and it's, you know, a, a pretty major um, major force in our history. Um, and a lot of it, and some of it was just moving because they needed somewhere to go. But a lot of it was also very intentional where they're saying, we're going to send colonies to the new world because we want to evangelize the Indians. Um, and, and not just we need somewhere to go, but we actually were living at peace or perhaps mostly peaceful in England um, in a comfortable life. But we're going to give that up to go to the new world. And I mean... In Calvin, even far earlier, he had that same vision, right? He sent a, a group of missionaries to Brazil to try to, to, you know, reach the gospel in Brazil. I mean, the the estimate is that Geneva sent out sent out 
The estimate is that Geneva sent out about 4,000 missionaries, and about half of them went to France. And the vast majority of the ones that went to France died. They were killed by by the French. But still, they had this huge you know, church planning movement that it happened, but but it wasn't just there. They sent them all over the world and as you know, as far away as Brazil, which when you think about it in the in the sixteenth century going to Brazil, that's that's quite the feat. And it's interesting the mentality they had as they're sending out these people to the new world. Um, because when we think about sending a missionary, we're gonna send a couple people or a couple families, or maybe even just one family. Or the youth uh, group. Yeah. But you know we're we're, we're, talk, you know, we're talking long term, so we're going to send someone there for years, and their goal is to preach to, to the people there. And while there was that was something that these Reformation missionaries were interested in doing, they also saw that this is like half the world, or more than half the world, where there just is no Christianity there. And so just them saying we're going to get a group of a hundred of us, and we're just going to go live there, and we're going to spend a lot of time just surviving. We're not going to be able to immediately be preaching to the Indians all the time because we're going to be maybe having to fight the Indians because they're trying to kill us. You know, maybe we're just trying to grow food to survive and, you know, we'll talk to the Indians when we can. But they, they saw that as we're going, to sp- <coughs> we're going to start shining the light to this continent that has no Christianity in it at all. And, you know, maybe maybe in a decade, maybe in our children's generation will be able to actually do more of an outreach intentionally to the natives um, where we have that stable society there. And you look at the fruit of that, you know, even, you know, you look at the number of descendants from the natives of the time who are now Christians. I mean, it it must be astronomical. I don't don't have a number, but I mean, we don't know how many people are Christians exactly. But, you know, you look at the number of people and how many of them are descended from the natives and, you know, the impact that that had Versus if you adopt the idea that I've even seen different missionary groups saying, well, how you know, can we really like go to these countries? Like, aren't we imposing stuff on them? And if the Europeans had that mentality of we can't go touch these cultures, I mean, they would, no, there'd be no Christians in the United States. I mean, you look at like the pilgrims, right? I mean, the pilgrims walk into uh, an environment when they move here, like you said, as a group of people that were setting up a community. And when they come into the the area we forget what the indians are like i mean they're most indian tribes got attacked at least once every three years and pretty much you know had all their crops taken away really serious damage i mean this was it was a incredible amount of warfare that we can't even imagine that this was just the state of their life and then all of a sudden the pilgrims come in and they're worried about establishing a community but in doing that the best way to establish a community is to reduce all the wars and they're not focusing on sending out what we would call missionaries to go preach the gospel to these Indians. But it ends up that there's a whole bunch of praying Indians that come out of this. And there were some people that were deliberate, but a lot of it is they just come and they come, you know, the just shall live by faith. And they come and they see a people that are living completely different than they're living that's actually bringing peace to a region. And I mean, they we forget that they bring peace for like 50 years until King Philip's War. And so, I mean, and it's almost like a secondary thing, but this actually causes people to go, This their religion is completely different than ours. Their religion produces something totally different. And that's what real missionary work looks like frequently. It's not just say, let's preach the gospel and then go home because they now know the gospel. No, it's actually showing how the just shall live by their faith. And it's something that if you know anything about the pilgrim story, you probably know how you know, Squanto comes and teaches them how they put the fish in the corn thing and it grows the corn stalk, you know, and the story is, well, the pilgrims learn from the Indians how to grow food. Well, the reality is within a couple years of the um, pilgrims coming to the, the, to Massachusetts, they were selling the Indians a lot of corn because they were doing a better job growing than the people who had been living there for centuries, for millennia. They were able to, you know, I mean, they did bring some technology, but, you know, the work ethic, the technology that they had that came from the culture that they had, they were able to suddenly be saving the Indians from starvation. So, you know, the story, while the story is true, it's just a, it's a small part of what actually happened, which was a revolution in a lot of things. And when you're bringing the spiritual bread of life to be also bringing the physical bread of life is a good thing. I mean, they, they estimate that, 
by introducing the hoe to the Indians, within five years, starvation was wiped out among the Indians. I mean, just, just the hoe. Because you can produce so much more food if you have a hoe than if you're just doing it with a stick. And that alone, and they introduced it, they sold them, they, they, they were more than happy to trade with the Indians. And all of a sudden, they've eliminated starvation. Think about that. You have a society where they expect in any given year, if you don't get the rain at the perfect time, there will be a certain percentage of your tribe that's going to starve to death. And then five years later, there's no starvation. I mean, it's like shocking. And this is the picture of how the gospel comes in there. And they go, wow, this is, you know, <laughs> this, the just shall live by their faith. And they're saying this is, this is a completely different religion and a different people. And, and we don't think of that with missionaries anymore. We don't think that's what it should look like. But it's actually incredibly successful, a lot more successful than somebody going over there for a year and preaching to these, these tribes where they're getting a check-in from overseas so that they have they live better than everybody that's around them. And they're not showing that they're living by faith. They're living by faith in their, their denomination back in the United States which was completely opposite of what the pilgrims did, right? The pilgrims came and they went, yeah, we hope to get some more supplies from the from England. And and that's how you actually transfer faith is the people that are walking saying God is sovereign. He'll give us success he'll, here. He'll feed us. He'll kill us if he wants to kill us. And all that does flow from the doctrine of election. If God is sovereign over who lives eternally, he's also sovereign over who lives temporally. Right, and something where, you know, in the, the future waves of missionaries, they'd come with, with the Bible, with the box of medicine, and with the farming tools, where they're able to, you know, not only give them, you know, true doctrine, the, the way of eternal life, but also, you know, bring temporal healing and temporal food. Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, I was in a place in Nigeria, obviously, that was evangelized by the, the South Africans, right? The Boers. And like their emblem of their denomination is exactly that. It's a Bible, a bo and it's three boxes. One was a box of Bibles, one bo was a box of farming tools, and one was a box of medicines. And that's what they basically, all their evangelism, whenever they sent out a group of people to plant a church, they always took the three boxes because they said all three were needed in order to actually testify that the truth, the full truth of the gospel and not a truncated truth of this is just the set of facts that you need to know, but that the gospel transforms. Because medicines wouldn't be here without the gospel because mankind is like the Native Americans, which are just barbarous, right? Barbarous. That too. <laughs> they were barbers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they were very much barbarians, and that is the nature of man. It's the gospel that brings order, that causes people to actually do things different. And we tend to not think of missionaries doing that, but that is that is important for missionaries to do. I think one thing that you've kind of we've kind of said throughout this is that's a real difference between I think the church today and the church at the time of the Reformation is they understood the the high stakes of sharing the gospel because you look at, I mean, the, you, you mentioned the uh, St. Bartholomew's massacre, you know, the, the people, you know, so that people get displaced, they go to Geneva, that they, they get sent back, you know, they're going back to their own country, right. To preach the gospel. And well, they were told they'd be killed if they didn't flee, which right. is why they fled in the first place. And so they go back and they, they end up being put to death. When you mentioned uh, King Philip's war, where like, I mean, a lot of people, if you hear King Philip's war, you don't know, King Soul's War was a war was was an Indian was an Indian king who called himself King Philip, right? I mean, and he was attacking because he said he was attacking the Indians who had become converted Indians. because he didn't want he was seeing their culture be destroyed. And so there's this part where I mean you see the reaction of people to the gospel is pretty strong. And even King Philip, right? He was a pig farmer and he sold his pigs to the to the pilgrims. So even he who is trying to preserve the culture, he's taking advantage of the culture they introduced as he's preserving the culture. So it wasn't like King Philip was trying to be a good Indian like 50 years ago, 50 years before what a good Indian looked like. Not at all. He was very much an Indian that had been incredibly affected by the culture, but he's still saying we need to protect our Indian ways. 
I mean, one of the things that happens whenever there's a group that's against God and against his word and they think they have power and they think there's no one to oppose them is they, they get sloppy and lazy. I mean, like you look at like the, what you call it, the indulgences. Mm-hmm. They, they made themselves into sort of a joke. There was a part of it where people, you know, people could look at the indulgences and they went so far that there were a lot of people looking at it going, this is, this is ridiculous, right? You know, I mean, the Tetzel with. Just, just one thing that I would say there is a big advantage they had was communication was incredibly difficult. Sure. So we look back and think of them as a joke. And maybe some of the people nearby would think of them as a joke, but most people would have no clue because it was a hard, lot harder to transfer information. But one of the parallels I kind of wanted to bring toward is look at, you know, today it's not the church that's the enemy in a sense. I mean, but, you know, you have the state that's kind of the, the religion. That's, but I mean, you look at the transgenderism, they're going so far as to be, they're, there's a part of it where they're making themselves look ridiculous again. They're going so far as, and, and we need to understand there's a part of it where they'll go far, and there's a part of it where that opens the door for people to go, wait a minute, this is ridiculous. And you should understand there's going to, I think, my guess is there's going to be an opportunity again. There's, I mean, there is an opportunity right now, and the church, I mean, regardless of whether there's an opportunity, the church should do the work of God. The church should go out and do this. We should be, but we should just really understand we're coming up on this time where you can see, I mean, they're getting so drunk on their own power. They're getting so believing that they can do it anything. They can say that, a, they can say ridiculous things. They can change anything they want to change. And there's going to be a real opportunity here for the church. And I'm not sure that the church is really ready to capitalize on it in a sense. And so, I mean, we should just be really aware that God has some opportunities in our present time. They're not as bad as they were in the days. I mean, in some ways, I mean, but the wickedness is getting pretty great. And if the church doesn't stand up against it and the church doesn't actually speak, I mean, I saw a podcast the other day by Tim Poole and some other people, and they were they basically said in the first 15 minutes of it, we have to get rid of no-fault divorce because it is destroying marriage. It is destroy until you get rid of it, marriage is just dating. There is no stability. There is no, I mean, these are, none of the people on there are Christians. None of the people on there are arguing this from a Christian point of view. They're just looking at it going, we have destroyed ourselves. And so, I mean, there's there really are some parallels between what was going on at the time and what's going on now. And we should just really recognize that God has God has real opportunity for the church. We need to be, if Tim Poole's saying that, the church hasn't been nearly bold enough. The church is scared of saying some of these things. We need to be far bolder than we are. And part of it is that, I mean, you keep saying the church, and that's the dangerous part, right? Because there's a whole bunch of people who profess themselves to be Christians, but their faith has no testimony of difference between them and the people around them. Right. Right. We made There's everyone no Christians again. Right. We basically made everyone Christians, even as a society. We go, no, we're multicultural. We would never do that. We basically have watered down Christianity to the point that it has no meaning. We're, just, we're desperate to get people to sign up on the sign-up sheet to be a Christian. Right. And so we desperately want the numbers. And the reality is the, the true church, those who truly have right. faith, what we need to do is go back to what go back to what works, which is exalting the name of God. Holding God up, ascribe greatness to your God. And when we're ashamed of God, which the church largely is, it won't say anything in the public square frequently because it's ashamed of God. It goes, everything's supposed to get worse. Well, if you think that everything is supposed to get worse in our society, you're ashamed of God, whether you think it or not. Because basically what you're saying is God has no power over sin. He has no I mean, there's no purpose for Christ. He didn't do anything. And so you're very much ashamed of God when you do that, when you hold that position. That's the widely held position of the church. And so how can the church, when it says God's too weak to be able to do anything, unless he physically comes down and then he'll magically do everything. But right now he can't do anything. He's just helpless because it's physical things. Because the Holy Spirit isn't God. The church isn't willing to ascribe greatness to God until it starts to ascribe greatness to God, which is what happened at the Reformation. We should not expect there to be a true revival in America. And you look at the revivals. We even did one on the, where was that? Uh, Asbury. Asbury revival. And it's like, they weren't ascribing greatness to God. They were ascribing greatness to each other. You know, and and that's not how a community revives. The way a revival happens is people actually start start to see God for who he is. And so people go, the doctrine of of election, why would you ever go evangelize? It's just the opposite. 
It's about the glory of God, and that's why you're supposed to go evangelize. It's about the glory of God. Is it worth saying that, you know, we talk about Lutheran churches, but in Luther's day, they didn't talk about Lutheran churches. It wasn't the Lutheran doctrine. They were, they called them evangelical churches in Germany, and it was the evangelical faith that Luther was preaching that he was in trouble for. That was the way it was described. And it would be described that way in England. It would be described that way in France. It would, I mean, they they weren't saying we're following Calvin. They would say, you know, the evangelical. We need to like actually proclaim the truth of who God is and how He actually breaks the bondage of sin. That there's good news, and not just this this tepid Christianity that there was before, where you just do these rites and then they maybe make you feel better so that you can sleep at night. I mean, and there's plenty of other lessons for our day for not for the big C church, but for any little C church. You know, you look at what happens with Luther, and and he has a whole bunch of people who are coming to his university, and he gets these students who are trained, and then they go home. And that's how the doctor, and that's how his doctrine spread in other countries. Well, and you look at what's happening with Calvin. If, if, you're, if the goal of your church is to accumulate a lot of people and keep them there, that's a bad church. Right. But if the goal of your church is keep the people here long enough that they can be doing the work of God and then send them out when they're ready to go out somewhere where there's work to do elsewhere, then you, you know, then you can say you're a healthy church and you can really say it if, if they're willing to go out and die for it. Right. Right. Which means for individuals that we need to be ready to do things that make us uncomfortable. You know, we're happy in this nice, great church, you know. Maybe we're not in our homeland anymore. Now we're in Geneva, but hey, this is great. No one's going to try to kill us. And now we have to face the reality that we that, that the call is to leave this sanctuary of safety behind and go back where there's work to be done and where we might die. And but that's the that's the call we have. And, and thankfully, in the United States, we're we're not facing death, so it's it's easy. It's easy. Yeah. Imagine if your pastor comes to you and says, "Oh, good, good to see you in church this this week." I'll give you about three years, <laughs> and then you're going back. They write and they might kill first. you. Yeah, yeah. Pack your stuff in a coffin because you're not coming back. You just drop that like a joke, but that's what that's how missionaries Used traveled think, in. Right? In my dad was telling me when 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 he went on a mission trip with you, that was one of the most striking things. As you talked about the missionaries who went through Nigeria. And they used coffins as their suitcases. Right. It's just a very that different way very of thinking. Normal way because now you went and you said goodbye because you had no expectation that you would ever see any of those people ever again. Even if you just go from Geneva to France, it's it's very unlikely that you'll ever see any of them again, even if you're not killed. Because traveling was just that much more difficult. And we forget how because of our conveniences, how much easier things are now. And same with spreading the word, same with, you know, all the technology has come so that we can do this much easier, but yet we're failing as much as the church, the true church was failing before Luther comes along. And we need to look at it and say, what should we be doing differently? Because we definitely need to be doing something differently. And I would argue strongly that what we need to do is start to ascribe greatness to God, that that's the core problem is that the church wants to talk about how it helps people. The church wants to talk about, and the church isn't saying God is glorious and God is here for his glory. And we don't teach, you know, it, Habakkuk 2.14 says, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's what God's about. And that's what the church needs to be about. And that's what drives, that's what drives revival. And that's what drive, drove revival after the Reformation is people started to understand who God really was and started to really proclaim it. And the world was transformed. I remember Paul Washer saying something once about missions work that, that changed the way that I think about it, where he said, what should, when, if you want to be a missionary, what is your heart? Is your heart for, oh, there's people that don't know the gospel? Or is it there are places where God's name is not glorified? And it's just, oh, I mean, it's not... It's not a bad thing for you to want people to have the gospel, but but what he's illustrating there is there's this real distinction between something that's man-centered and something that's God-centered, 
And of course, if you get the God-centered part, you're going to have a heart for people getting the gospel. But you start there, that that's really important, is there are places where God's name is not glorified, and his name needs to be glorified as the waters cover the sea. I mean, we were recently at the church trying to figure out what our longer term plan or medium term plan is maybe, you know, like an eight year plan for Nigeria. That was the one of the things I was struggling with. Should the the eight year plan for Nigeria just be for them to see how they are under the judgment of God and not even worry about planning churches, not even worry about increasing their knowledge, just get them to fear God because that alone increases the glory of God. That alone is fulfilling. Even though you do desire people to be saved, you do desire these other things, that's a legitimate mission is just to get the fear of God to come on a place so that they see this is the judgment hand of God rather than saying that, oh, no, we love Jesus when their hearts are so far from Jesus. And the church needs to be willing to say that is successful evangelism. If all they get out of it is I'm going to hell, that is really successful evangelism. And if you're worried, that's not what we decided to do. So we decided that would be one of several goals. And I'm not sure that we made the right decision, but. We and, you, and we'd argue that you shouldn't be worried. I mean, if you shouldn't be worried if we had chosen the other thing. So as we consider the missionary movement that came out of the Reformation, it's really useful to, to think about how different it is than we do missions today. The focus was different. It was on the glory of God. The The means were different. It was about knowledge, not just about coming in and showing a film and saying without much knowledge that these people are Christians. It's about actually developing a group of people that are living by their faith. And it would be really helpful for the church and for the, the, for the world if the church got back to how missions should look like. There's much we can learn from the Reformation about what missions really should be. Thanks for joining us. This has been The Conquering Truth, a project of Reformation Baptist Church. If you found this helpful, you can visit us online at theconqueringtruth.com and subscribe here or in your favorite podcast app. Thanks for watching.